Hello, fiendlings. How the hell are you? The M2 Valentine's Day Massacre continues with an extra episode for the week. That way you can get more M2 goodness in your ear holes and prepare yourself to go and take advantage of the 99 cent sale for the Black Ebook going on right now. If you have KDP, you're also in luck because both the Black and Arrival are listed there for you to read to your heart's content. I've heard from folks that Arrival, for some reason, still isn't in the Audible store, but it should be in the next several days. One more content? If you want to listen to me babble live, you can find me on the Dead Robot Society live stream every Saturday from 3 to 4 p.m. Central, followed by a special Patreon Buy Me a Coffee private stream. Join us for conversations about writing, the art of narrative, and a ton of pop culture discussions as well as Q&A with chat. Subscribe to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Paul E. Cooley and make sure you never miss an episode of DRS or any other nonsense I decide to put up there. Little writing update for you before we get out of here. I'm 90% finished with the first draft of The Neptune Scar, the novel that takes place immediately following the Derelict Saga. Once it's finished and has gone through a little spit and polish, I'll begin recording it for my Patreon, BMAC, and Ko-Fi members. When we get closer to that date, I'll let you know. I have a confession to make. I'm a caffeine junkie, and rather than enter a 12-step program, I discovered Corpse Coffee. Visit CorpseCoffee.com and check out their array of coffees, boutique teas, and their wonderfully weird webcomic. Visit CorpseCoffee.com and get the dead in your cup. With that, I'm off to write more fiction and hopefully get a book finished. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's episode two of The Black. The bridge was spotless. Vray Bell sipped from an aluminum mug of black coffee, PPE's logo branded on its side, he sighed with pleasure as the strong coffee slid down his throat. Through the clean windows, he watched the Zodiac head out into the ocean, JP gunning the engine too fast and Catfish standing on the bow like he was in some damn action movie. Maybe the tech would fall out of the boat, would certainly serve the smug son of a bitch right. God, but Vraybell hated those two. A little over a week and they'd managed to turn his crew's routines into a mess. Unannounced trips into the ocean. No dive plans, no warning they were going to drop those damned fish into the ocean. Hell, the only warning Vraybell got was when they absolutely needed something from his crew. His crew. Not Calhoun's. Not PPE's. Vraybell's crew. Every worker on the rig had been handpicked by him. Except, of course, for Calhoun's rejects. VP Simpson had told Vraybell he was to do everything to help Calhoun's team. Without them, the rig might as well be hunting for oil in a desert, or so the VP thought. Vraybell knew that was bullshit. He may not be a geologist, but he'd been working the oil fields and oceans for more than 20 years. He'd put his crew up against any other rig any day of the year. But Calhoun had the toys, the new drill bit tech, and Catfish's new robots. Plus, that Sigler geologist was supposed to be a whiz kid. Didn't matter. They were all a bunch of undisciplined, entitled assholes. As far as he was concerned, Calhoun's team could go fuck themselves. He'd sent several private emails to Simpson, begging for the right to throw Catfish and JP off the rig. Simpson had responded with a tersely worded email that tried to put Vraybell in his place. Goddamn suit. When the executives of a major oil exploration consortium had no experience with life on a rig, the goddamned world was doomed. So he'd have to make Calhoun happy, or at least stay out of the man's way. So long, of course, as the old engineer stayed out of his. Vraybell didn't care if Calhoun was going to make everyone rich or not. This was Vraybell's rig, and he took orders from no one. He'd personally overseen the rig's construction, spent every day with the crew putting the monster together piece by piece. Tons and tons of steel, pressure vessels, miles of pipe, generators, cabling and hydraulics. He'd gone over every detail, knew every nook and cranny of the huge machine. He took another sip of the coffee. He hated exploration rigs. They were built out in the middle of nowhere with no guarantee of production yield. On top of that, the rigs were usually untested, and the engineers were always tweaking the design. In other words, it was a guaranteed clusterfuck. But Leaguer was his rig, and it would work. Steve Gomez, the tool pusher, and his team would do their jobs. 
provided there was some goddamn black gold beneath the soil, and provided Calhoun's team found the sweet spot to drill, it would all work. The Zodiac had become a black dot on the horizon. If he hadn't been looking for it, he wouldn't have noticed it. Catfish and JP were no doubt swimming with the fish instead of doing their jobs. Typical. When Calhoun arrived, Vraybell was going to have a long talk with the man. The rest of the crew hated JP and Catfish. They knew the two men were getting paid a tremendous amount of money, and so far all they'd done was fuck off. They hadn't been in the crew assignments for maintenance, waste disposal, or cleaning. In other words, they only did what they wanted to, and the rest of the crew had taken notice. Vraybell smiled to himself. Of course he'd made sure the rest of the crew knew all of that. There wouldn't be any poker games including those guys. If Vraybell had his way, their lives on Leaguer would be as miserable as he could make them. Unless they struck gold. In that case, those assholes would be heroes. At least to PPE. Didn't matter. Leaguer was an exploration rig, not a production rig. Employees of PPE didn't get a cut of the profits other than their 401ks, stock options, and bonuses. With the exception of the bonuses and enhancing their reps, the crew couldn't care less about striking it rich. And that's why they'd work hard for Vraybell. The workers that impressed him could get jobs anywhere in the industry. Continually screw up, he'd make sure you had difficulty finding a job cleaning a latrine. But PPE was providing Vraybell one hell of a bonus if the rig did its job and found the black. So he'd play nice, to a point. Calhoun and his boys would get what they needed. He stared out at the cloud-covered sky. White puffs of cotton obscured the sun. There was no rain in the forecast, but the storm from the mainland was heading their way. It might take a couple of days, but the system could sneak up on top of them. Vraybell made a mental note to keep an eye on the radar. PPE's meteorologists would let them know if the nasty was approaching, but that didn't guarantee the land lubbers would spot it before it was on top of them. Footsteps on the stairs. Someone was headed up to the bridge. Vraybell took a long draft from his coffee and closed his eyes. The steps were timid. He smiled to himself. The sounds reached the top of the stairs and the bridge hatch opened. Hello, Vraybell said without turning around. Hi, Steve Gomez said. Got a minute? Vraybell turned in his chair and took another sip of coffee. The tool pusher stood in the doorway, his filthy black ball cap in his hands. The man's heavy denim coveralls were covered in dark stains. Gomez ran a hand through his thick black hair and waited patiently. What's up? Vraybell asked. We went ahead and prepped the drill string, Gomez said. And according to Catfish, the ROV's are ready to drop the sinks. Gomez cleared his throat. I think we're pretty much ready once Calhoun gets here. Vraybell nodded. Good job. Is there anything left outstanding? Nope. I think we got it all. Okay, Vraybell said and placed his empty mug on the console. Tell your people they're on an extended break. We've got nothing to do until the supply ship gets here. Gomez smiled. They'll like that. I'm sure you will too, Vraybell chuckled. So either take a nap or get out your lines and catch us some dinner. Gomez bowed. We can definitely catch some fish. He turned and walked back down the stairs. Vraybell's mouth watered. Gomez and the other Mexicans were damn good at fishing. They'd stand on the lower platforms and dangle lines down in the water near the pilings. Fish treated the substructure like a reef. Once or twice, Gomez had even snagged himself a shark. He looked at the black diving watch on his wrist. The supply ship was due in four hours. If the storm hadn't knocked them off schedule, they'd arrive before dinner. He hoped his people had a chance to eat before the loadout. It was going to be a long night. The Zodiac's engine died. Catfish turned around and glanced at JP. The diver was smiling. The pontoon boat slowed and then bumped gently in the waves. The clouds were thick, but there was still no sign of rain in them. Catfish unclipped the yellow radio from his belt and stared at its display. Damn it. What's the problem? JP called from the back. It should be right here. We're on top of it, Catfish said. JP leaned over the side and stared into the water. Uh, I don't see it. You sure it surfaced? Yeah, Catfish said. He walked forward to the bow and leaned over. The light made it tricky to see further than a few feet down. He held a hand above his eyes and let them relax. 
Finding a bright yellow torpedo in the water shouldn't be this difficult. The sensor box was getting a signal from the dunce. We have to be sitting on top of it. Bullshit. It's longer than the damn boat. We'd be able to see it fore or aft. The box in Catfish's hand pinged. He stared at it and groaned. Okay, it's here and we are on top of it. Where the hell is it? He turned to JP and growled. Fifteen meters below us. Something's wrong with the ballast. JP rolled his eyes. Guess I know what I'm doing. He uncoiled one of the tow cables and threw it into the water. The heavy cable dropped out of sight immediately. Catfish sighed, grabbed a scuba tank, and began putting it on JP. I love it when a man dresses me, JP said in an effeminate voice. I'll be sure and tell someone that gives a shit, Catfish said. He tightened the straps and clapped JP on the shoulder. You want me down with you? JP shook his head. No, you stay with the boat. I may need the other tow rope, besides one diver down at a time, right? Catfish grinned. Unless we're fishing? He grabbed the orange buoy and threw it over the side. There were no other boats for miles, and the support ship was still hours away, but putting the diver buoy in the water was habit. Unless we're fishing, JP said. He put on his mask and attached the fins to his dive boots. Once they were connected, he gave Catfish a thumbs up and dropped backwards into the ocean. The moment he entered the water, he felt at home. Seal training aside, he'd always loved the ocean. It didn't matter if he was swimming a few miles to the beachhead, placing mines beneath a ship, inspecting a rig substructure, or spearfishing. The water was where he belonged. Growing up in the Keys meant there wasn't much to do that didn't involve the ocean. Reef diving, spiny-tailed lobster hunting, and spearfishing were the distractions he loved as a kid. When he joined the Navy at 18, he was lean and slight, but in great shape. By the time he was 20, he was well-muscled and a natural for the seals. He floated beneath the Zodiac. The water was clear, but without steady light from the sun, the depths rapidly became dark as pitch. JP looked down and saw the telltale yellow of the dunce. JP stopped and reached for the tow rope, the bright orange cable easy to see in the water. He grabbed it with his gloved hand, pulled it through the loop of his webbing, and flipped over. He kicked hard and easily made it down to the torpedo-shaped AUV. He unhooked the cable from his belt and slid it through the steel grommets on the AUV's nose. When Catfish had designed the new gear, he would made sure they could be towed relatively easily. JP slid beneath the torpedo-shaped robot and felt for the bottom clasp, found it, and turned it clockwise. Green LEDs created wan light around him. He stared at the controls. A red light blinked in the corner. JP frowned around his rebreather. Catfish had been right. The ballast control was stuck. He pushed back until he was an arm's length away from the AUV and touched the control panel's red light. Bubbles shot up as the robot emptied the rest of the water that kept it below the surface. The AUV quickly rose next to the Zodiac. Something bumped against JP's leg and he turned quickly. A small hammerhead shark swam past him. He looked down. A school of redfish was hightailing it through the water. Two more sharks, larger than the small hammerhead, chased the group of fish. Once the blood started flowing from one of those fish, more sharks would show up. Shaking his head, he kicked for topside. Within a few seconds, his head popped up on the other side of the Zodiac. Catfish was already tightening up the cable that held the AUV. JP scrambled up the rope ladder and into the boat. He pulled off his mask and killed the oxygen supply on the tank. The tech turned toward him, a grim smile on his face. Ballast? JP nodded as he stripped out of the scuba gear. And to hit the control panel. Guessing you should close that. Catfish growled and punched a button on the control box. It lit up green. How come you're taking off the tank? Aren't we spearfishing? The former seal shook his head. No fishing today. Not down there anyway. We got sharks and more coming. Damn it, Catfish said. He tied the cable through the cleats and used a traction tool to tighten everything. Once the AUV was only a few feet behind the boat, he sat on the side of the pontoon and stared down into the water. So much for time off. JP shrugged. Well, maybe we could figure out what's wrong with the dunce. Maybe, Catfish said. Let's get back to the rig. Maybe we'll have better luck later.
After parking the Zodiac in the bay, JP hooked up the lift cables and hoisted the AUV out of the water. The mechanized lift made short work of raising the 1,400 pounds of steel and instrumentation. Before JP finished putting the AUV up for maintenance, Catfish was running up the stairs to the stateroom to get his laptop and cords. The AUVs all had wireless interface points, so he could communicate with them without hooking up directly. But he didn't want to chance it with number five. After shrugging his way through the narrow halls and running back down the steps, he was tired and out of breath. JP just grinned at him. What? Catfish asked as he hooked up the cords from the laptop to the control panel. If you stopped smoking, JP said, maybe you wouldn't be out of breath after a little jog. Catfish flipped him off, put the laptop on the deck's mechanical control box and opened the lid. The display lit up with green text on a black background. He typed in the commands to open a connection to the AUV's onboard computer. JP moved behind him and stared over his shoulder as Catfish ran diagnostics. Any ideas? He asked. The long-haired tech sucked his teeth. Ballast control failure. He shook his head. We're gonna have to open her up and replace the controller. God damn it. Well, JP said, so much for the fishing. You got that right, Catfish said. We need the dunce online tomorrow. He turned to the former seal. Calhoun wants full coverage of the drill string and the wellhead. If we don't have it, he licked his lips. It's going to be my ass. Well, you could always send down an ROV to check most of the drill string. Catfish shook his head. No, the ROVs aren't pressurized for that depth. He gritted his teeth. 30,000 feet's a bit over their design params. One of them might make it down there, but I can't guarantee it won't implode. And then we lose another two million dollars? Catfish rubbed his chin. Right, PPE already freaked out about the lease of the equipment, not to mention our hourly costs. I can't afford to lose any of them. JP walked over to the row of toolboxes. When he and Catfish had arrived, the first thing they'd done after stowing the AUVs was unload boxes of parts and tools for the electronics. He'd hoped they wouldn't have to use them, but that had been yet another pipe dream. He pulled out a cordless drill, set the bit, and held it up. Let's get into surgery, he said. Catfish groaned and moved to help. The support ship arrived early. The rig crew was on break and hadn't even eaten yet. By the time Vraybell reached the lower decks, the ship's crane was already raised in the air. He announced over the loudspeaker that all personnel were to immediately hit the chow line. Instead of joining them, he headed to the support ship's catwalk. Calhoun and his geologist were walking off the ship and onto the rig, Calhoun eyeing the empty deck. He offered Vraybell his large hand. The rig chief shook it, but didn't smile. Welcome back aboard the leaguer, he said. Calhoun looked around. Where's the crew? We gotta get this stuff offloaded. Vraybell shook his head. You're over an hour early. They haven't eaten, soon as they get done with their dinner break. Dinner break, Calhoun interrupted. This support ship has to do a turnaround ASAP. The captain busted his ass getting us here early. The rig chief clamped down on the urge to tell this asshole to go to hell. Simpson would have his balls if he was that rude to their drilling brain. After they get some chow, they'll be down here. I promise. We'll get it unloaded. Calhoun sighed. Okay. Fair enough. Sorry, Vraybell. Been a damn long day and that storm kicked our ass. Sigler stood behind her boss. The short, thin woman stepped out from behind him, smiled at Vraybell and offered her hand. Vraybell shook it. Ms. Ziegler, he said. The woman's strong grip brought a smile to his face. He'd met her twice before, but every time he shook hands with her, he was surprised how strong she was. Vraybell, she said. And Shana, please. Right he said. Shauna. He pointed to the stairs. If y'all are hungry, you're welcome to hit the chow line. Calhoun glanced at his geologist. Shauna, go ahead and get up there. Gonna be a long night and Vraybell and I need to discuss a few things. She raised her eyebrows and then nodded. She swept a lock of raven hair out of her eyes. Guess I'll do that. Where are Catfish and JP? Vraybell rolled his eyes. They're on the lower deck, doing some maintenance on one of the robots. She smiled. I'll go say hello before I get some food. She started walking to the metal staircase. 
Make sure they eat too, Calhoun called after her. Shauna didn't turn, but raised a hand to show she'd heard him. Raybell, Calhoun said. Got time for a little walk? Vraybell gritted his teeth, but nodded. He pointed toward the back of the loading deck. As they walked in silence toward the generators, the roar drowned out the sound of the waves and the crew. When they reached the furthest point, he slowed and turned to Calhoun. Well, Calhoun, what do you need to babble about? I'm sure it has to do with. First off, Calhoun said, I want to apologize for Catfish and JP. Vraybell blinked. Apologize? The older man nodded. Yes, I'll make sure they behave themselves. No one wants this operation to go more smoothly than I do. I'd rather we focus on getting to the black than have everyone pissed at everyone else. Well, Raybell smiled. That's good to hear. But, Calhoun said and pulled a cigar from his shirt pocket. I need a little something from you, too. And that would be, Raybell said, dreading Calhoun's response. The engineer smiled. We need this crew to work together. I can't have my guys treated like outsiders any more than you can afford my team walking all over you and your rig. There has to be some mutual respect. Vraybell nodded. He'd hated both JP and Catfish on sight. The rest of the crew had picked up on that, not to mention his constant bitching about them. He had expected some kind of blowout with Calhoun, some epic showdown including calls and emails to Simpson. But Calhoun had caught him off guard. Okay, he said. Agreed. The older man offered his hand. I hope we could put this unpleasant shit behind us and focus on getting the job done. Vraybell shook it. All right, I'll do my best to get along. And I'll do my best to rein in those two assholes, Calhoun smiled. Okay, I still don't like them, Vraybell said. Calhoun chuckled. You don't have to. Just know they're damn good at their jobs. He leaned in close enough for Vraybell to smell the ghost of old tobacco. Otherwise, I would have fired them both a long time ago. Vraybell laughed. Glad to hear that. He pointed at the cigar. You can light that down here or up on the top deck if you like. Just um, be careful about the cherry. Calhoun pulled the wet, ended cigar from his mouth. Sorry, nervous habit of mine, he said. I promise not to smoke until the lamp is lit, so to speak. He tapped his foot. You eating yet? Vraybell shook his head. Then let's get some chow. The lower deck was damned hot. The sun was quickly disappearing over the horizon, but between the day's humidity and the heat from the generators, the air was stifling. Her brow was beaded with sweat. She walked down the metal stairs, work boots clanging against steel. Above the din of the generators, she heard cursing and power tools. Catfish was throwing a tantrum. She sighed, and it was time to play mommy again. When she reached the bottom, she saw what she feared. An AUV hung low from the ceiling, buoyed by steel cables. The top of the machine lay on the deck. Catfish typed furiously on his laptop while JP watched a voltage meter. Is it clicking? Catfish asked. How should I know? JP yelled back. I can't hear a damn thing. Well, it should at least be moving. Boys, Shauna yelled. JP and Catfish swung their head toward her. Catfish's patented glare turning into a wide smile. JP just groaned. It was his usual greeting to her. Look out, JP said. The worrier has arrived. Shauna stepped forward and shook JP's hand. Catfish walked from the control box and hugged her. Good to see you, girl. Guess you arrived early? She nodded. Good to see you, too, she said. She pointed to the AUV. Having problems? Catfish's easy grin disappeared into a snarl. You could say that. Damn thing just won't get its shit together. Gremlins, she frowned. What's the problem? JP laughed. Ballast control. Today, that is. Yesterday? Propeller. Day before? Radio signal. She shook her head. Faulty actuator? Think so, Catfish said and pointed at JP. I'd know for sure if that deaf guy over there could hear it clicking. She walked to the AUV. The leads were connected to a tiny clear box with a visible switch. She leaned down and studied it. Try it now. Catfish walked back to the laptop and hit a few keystrokes. 
a tiny arc of light, barely visible, spread between the metal contacts in the clear bar. Stop, she said, and turned to the engineer. You realize it's fried, right? What? JP asked. What are you talking about? She pointed to a black smudge on the outer case. It shorted out. JP, grab me a new one from the case. The former seal opened his mouth to protest and then closed it. He walked to one of the black equipment cases and rummaged until he put his hands on a new actuator. Gimme, Shauna said and put out her hand. He put the plastic in her palm. With her other hand, she loosened the connections and pulled the actuator from the AUV's innards. Catfish yelped as she tossed it to the deck. Hey, I only have so many of those. She glanced at him with a grin. And that one is toast. She wriggled the new box in until the connections clicked. She didn't hear the contacts slide in, but she felt the sharp snap of the female-male plugs lining up. There, try it now. Shaking his head, Catfish typed a few keys. The tiny actuator arm flipped and the light went green on the control board. I'll be damned, JP said. Catfish whooped. Damn it, girl, where you been all my life? Shauna smiled. Sometimes it takes a woman's touch. Or a clue. JP said. Fingers flying across the keyboard, Catfish stared at the laptop as the commands went through. After a moment, he grinned. I think we might be in business. Good, Shauna said. Now let's get this damned thing back together again so we can get some food. Food, JP growled. Hungry, hungry diver. Shauna reached over and petted the AUV side. Calhoun told me to make sure you kids ate. Kids. JP said, we're both older than you. She glared at him. And yet you still need a mother to make sure you behave. Catfish chuckled. True that, he closed the laptop. Before we get up there, is Calhoun in a bad mood? She shrugged. JP put the top fitting back on the AUV. He's not happy about all the screaming and bitching Vraybell's been doing. Great, Catfish said. That man is a fucking killjoy. Language? she said and shook a finger at him. Catfish blushed beneath his scraggly beard. And yeah, he's a serious fucktard, but we have to work with him. JP fitted torque screws into the holes. We know, he said, and guided the power tool's bit onto the head. He's just such an officious prick. He thumbed the trigger and the deck filled with noise. The bit whirred and tightened the screw. When it reached the torque limit, the bit slapped and clicked. JP turned it off and slotted the next one. I know, she said, but we're going to be living with these folks for at least six weeks. Might be good for you two to make amends before we kill each other. Catfish rolled his eyes. Yes, mom. She nodded. Now let's get this sucker put to bed so we can eat. I'm freaking starved.